The Little Mermaid 2023 is Disney's latest soulless cash grab that was released to theaters, one that I had the displeasure of watching on opening weekend, because this is a film that continues misunderstanding every single point that made the original animated film work in all of the wrong ways, where most of that criticism was actually shielded by the guise of diversity to promote the film in the first place. But gladly, this turned out to work against Disney when the film actually performed poorly overseas, opening to a box office of 566 million worldwide, which seems like a lot and about the same as Cinderella remake, but compared to the other Disney films that came before it in the same renaissance era that this film actually started, each film from that era actually grossed over $1 billion from Beauty and the Beast to The Lion King, showcasing that this is an abject failure for the company who, like everyone else, would have actually thought earlier this year that had a clear shot of a billion dollars due to people's nostalgia of the story despite the negative attention. The attention that most people actually focus on when it comes to the film on the subject of Ariel and the race swapping to promote shallow diversity on Disney's part, one that is still sad dominating the conversation before and after without regards to quality of the films as stories and art, not focusing on the important issues that really come into making them in the first place, which this video is actually meant to address. Because the reason I wanted to make this video was to start on a series of videos focusing on everything wrong with the remakes that it does to the original animation for the worst that we all fell in love with, like in regards to Mulan being a disastrous joke to one of my favorite Disney films that I want to cover and the blatant disrespect movies like Pinocchio actually showed, where all except Cinderella as I have covered, haven't really gotten the point of their movies at all, and how The Little Mermaid is no exception where I really want to show every single crucial detail to why this film is one of the worst ever made in the past few years, which doesn't have to do with Ariel's race at all, but how it's been used and abused by Disney on so many levels to actually promote the film no matter what, to pretend to actually care about cultural issues in the most laziest ways and are more agenda driven rather than story driven that can be universally enjoyed, and how I think some people just still don't understand this knowing my first review on the film remained to be my most disliked video to date, not really getting the point to why this film really does work for the worse, the point where people just point fingers and blame it on race when that isn't the problem. Because the main critique to why people actually perceive this film actually failed to succeed as usual when it came out is that Asians are racist, that their culture doesn't take kindly to black mermaids and how the people who just hate the film in general around the world were just also racist, which that wasn't the case. That all we saw on the surface is how both sides use this issue to ignore the real problems with the movie at all, how anti-woke channels actually lauded the film's failures and shamelessly using Halle Bailey's face for every minor detail that didn't offer any real criticism other than uses pathetic rage bait that can be somehow racist in intent, and how others online just blame the culture of Asia being sheltered and racist to not accept a black mermaid. But going into it deeper actually shows that this is the main reason why the film failed. Sure, there are issues about diversity in Asia considering the region amongst other things, but that isn't the primary issue to why it failed, where most interviews that chop it up in Korea and so forth in China just showed that they didn't really like the film at all, and actually just seeing through the shallow promotion that Disney keeps doing to promote diversity around the world, how what it was doing was just bland and lifeless and Disney was only doing this to be more politically correct and so forth. The failures of the film in the region was mainly due to its merits of being a blatant cash grab and a boring story that never connected with them, one that just didn't look or feel as colorful as the original in any way, taking away from the more important elements to why it worked in the first place. And it isn't really fair to blame it on race or culture when other films like Black Panther actually succeeded in the regions, and how they do generally love Disney films too despite people saying they hate it now, evident by the recent success of the Pixar animated film Elemento in South Korea, where well over 6.5 million people at this point actually watched the film, or almost 13% of the entire population of the country, a pretty huge number that has become the third most watched animated film in the country after Disney's own Frozen films. I point this out because there clearly is an interest they have for animated Disney films, which this film is actually supposedly based on, for also their own previous live action remake film Aladdin released in the same year as Frozen 2 in 2019 also made 12 million admissions in Korea alone, really being a part of the reason that this film made a billion dollars, showcasing how popular these films are and how this one just failed on what it was overall as a movie. It doesn't have to do with race at all, it has to do with what people actually felt towards the movie. It's just that we need to take the perspective of the movie's enjoyment and how these issues are being used and abused by a company that actually couldn't care less about these issues except for profit. How we do actually want to see more diverse stories, but not something based upon a story that is designed to be a certain way, or how more people actually know how it was formed in the first place. To create original works that benefit us overall that needs to be seen rather than shallow lifeless remakes that everyone actually hates now. Spending too much time on something already done rather than creating something new. How more people just need 
need to realize that Disney used this as a tool in their factory that really doesn't care about the final product that's being delivered. Because the entire cast is filled with wonderful people, especially Halle Bailey herself who is a talented singer and actress but just let down by such an abysmal excuse for a film with poor direction amongst other things of being a remake. And how that's an issue that still is going to continue with Snow White and so forth, just making these movies with minor statements to say and adhere in modern times to be the darling of society even if it comes off being insincere. But spending too much time on this subject and topic really doesn't benefit us all from the real issues where I now would actually like to talk about the real problems in place that the film does that butchers every single point that the original film had, from its characters, its stories, and its songs. Because one of the major problems that these films have is the songs themselves, the ones that they're trying to replicate, how they try to keep up with modern sensitivities by changing things in the actual movie and in the lyrics itself, especially here in The Little Mermaid. Lyrics that were written by Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, where the latter of course returned to compose the score with Lin-Manuel Miranda and somehow actually turned for the worse. And I really want to highlight this problem now because these lyrics were actually written by Howard Ashman, a man whose talent is actually celebrated as a main driving force of the Disney renaissance, where without him, this era of Disney wouldn't have been successful as we know it today, where the removal of his lyrics from some songs is really disrespectful of Disney to be doing, especially ones done by a gay man, where they pride themselves on being the company of representing everyone, but now removing things of those who actually built it previously. But more importantly, what I want to highlight about Howard Ashman was his words about animation and musicals, which of course these films are actually musicals and how important it was for musicals to be done in this very medium. There's a big, big problem with music and film. In live action, music and live action. The only truth I know about it is it usually doesn't work. Music may have more license in the animated film in the same way that it does in the theater, simply because the level of reality is different. There's no game being played by a theater audience. We know that's happening right in front of us, and it's painted scenery, and it's not real. When we go to the movies, it's a real street, or it looks a lot more like a real street and we pretend it may be really happy. What he basically said here was actually true in all its aspects to what we see today, especially in films like The Little Mermaid, because it really just doesn't work this way it's shown in the film. Music and live action really doesn't work because it's harder to believe that this is real compared to how animation allows us to suspend our disbelief because the world was already designed that way. How he himself actually wrote these songs with the clear intention that it was going to be an animation because that's how the movie was going to be and the way they designed the characters. Which this one had the actors around them make it harder for you to actually follow constantly. It doesn't work in this sense of the live action film because it looks awful. Every attempt to do to try to replicate what worked actually makes it look worse. The only times that it remotely worked was when they weren't trying to adapt the stories like that. Once again bringing up films like Cinderella that knew the amount of realism it needed to ground itself and the potential films like Atlantis could do that focuses more on the realistic human element. And how films like The Little Mermaid instead have too many elements that make it harder to believe because the world wasn't designed that way and made it a bland experience instead. And that is something that's going to affect the quality of future films like Moana, which is the third film Disney is remaking that was directed by Musker and Clements, the men who brought in the renaissance and many classic stories like The Little Mermaid here itself and Aladdin, where Hercules is also going to get remade eventually, which makes me more upset about it. How they keep doing these films that had worlds clearly designed in one specific way with how the music and characters shine and dumbed down to just make a quick buck off of it instead. Like sure, go ahead Disney, remake every Musker and Clements film with none of the magic these two actually provided for the better. The only benefit this film really has is that it's at least not the worst live action remake, which isn't saying much but still clearly better than what The Lion King and Mulan combined ever did, doing the minimum to bring some sort of life back into the production but also at the cost of removing most of the life that the film actually brought originally, notably of course seen in the animal characters like Flounder and Sebastian, learning absolutely nothing from The Lion King itself and making it for the worse for those very characters. I mean, I will give Sebastian the benefit of the doubt of having the most expression in the film, but it still doesn't excuse him for being the wrong crab also and looking pretty awful. Because he is a ghost crab that is incapable of living underwater like he does for most of the film. Once again, easier to suspend your disbelief in the original animated crab because it works and it has expressions where this one doesn't actually make sense biologically, not believing for a second that any of this could actually work or how Flounder just seems so soulless as all of the lines in The Lion King. But I guess I couldn't expect much considering that this is a film directed by Rob Marshall, who did films like Me 
memoirs of a geisha, and more importantly for Disney, Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides and Mary Poppins Returns. Films that people aren't particularly fond of to this day, where this one is joining that list because most of its direction is very lackluster to what he was adapting, especially a film like this that feels directionless at most times, which makes no sense that for a film that is actually over two hours long compared to the original that is only an hour and 20 minutes. Because this is a movie that is going to showcase to us that sometimes less is more, compared to other films that actually need more, like Frozen because of how The Little Mermaid actually got its points across very well in its story, where this new one actually instead shows many unnecessary additions that harm the story rather than better it. And this starts at the very beginning when they set off the tone for the realistic film with a quote from Hans Christensen Andersen himself, the original author of The Little Mermaid, where it states, but a mermaid has no tears and therefore she suffers so much more. The reason they included this was to try and show the audience that they were diving into the depths of Ariel's story and decisions to make her shine more than the original in a different way rather than the sounds introducing the ship that Prince Eric is on with the other sea creatures on the surface and the ship, trying to present two worlds of differing opinions about what is out there, which is good in practice rather than what the original did, but hardly justified when we are reintroduced to the other world. The part where we all have to suffer so much more without any tears because of how stupid everything is under the sea. Because in the original, after our first introduction to Eric, we get introduced to the merfolk joining together for a grand celebration in Atlantica, how we see this grand palace under the water where they join in to showcase the world beneath ours, getting to see the subjects of the kingdom before the grand entrance of King Triton himself, the ruler of this very kingdom. But in the remake, we hardly get any of that in this poorly animated sequence that is trying to be real, how you notice that the CGI is absolutely shit, moving too fast and revealing a vast array of coral reefs instead of the kingdom of Atlantica and that grand majesty that the original animation brings. Where I guess that, despite having mermaids in your film, a palace under the sea with them and other sea creatures is just too unrealistic to portray in your film, if that makes any sense. This is something I want to highlight because these remakes constantly take things away rather than add things to the story or at least try to pretend to be realistic in that sense. But doing so actually limits the world more so when you realize than where it's actually supposed to be because it seems so minor and un un unimportant to the events happening in the film, compared to a grand entrance where he comes in to greet the Mer people during the show, how he just appears right there with his daughters for a casual meet and greet and that's it. This introduction is to show us the world that he lives in and that is grand with the concert performance to satisfy the king with his very daughters, the princess is giving a show to the subjects and of course being the daughters of the seven seas and whatnot, to try to show the roles that they actually serve and what she is supposed to serve at the beginning where in the case of the remake they're just there joining to meet with their father and nobody else, just probably expecting the audience to fulfill that role with no grand reveal whatsoever. This is also a scene where we must point out the shallow diversity that this film offers other than Ariel herself, because what they did for her sister sends the wrong message considering who their father is in King Triton and biology. Because taking one look at each of them from Ariel and so forth compared to the original film, you notice a stark contrast between the two that causes more confusion than needs to be. As he introduces each of them, we notice that they are of different races and colors. Not one is the same or believable in relation to Ariel or Triton. It's one that really sends the wrong message and showcases their intentions behind the racial casting of the characters that becomes hard to justify despite being mermaids. Because a lot of people excuse Ariel and these characters for being this way because she is a fictional fairy tale creature rather than what is perceived as being blackwashing a character. Similar to how many raised concerns if they were going to whitewash Mulan for their very remake. How it wouldn't make sense if they casted a white or black actress in the role of a Chinese hero. It does not make sense to do so for that race because of that region alone. And the same thing could be said for other people where the original story actually took place. Where doing something beyond that by doing this for each of their daughters where they do mention their mother from time to time does not logically make any biological sense even if we are talking about mermaids. The only way that it could be justified is if King Triton had a harem of wives rather than just one behind the queen's back, which really is the wrong message to send in a Disney movie if people actually think about it. There is no reason to do this for the story unless it is about the sham diversity from woke Disney and nothing more. It's fine for them to actually have this diverse group of mermaids, but having them all related to each other does not make any sense when the original had you believe that they are related. Sure, you can create answers, whatever, but that's actually a poor and lazy excuse to actually come up with when their biology matches humans except for the fact they have tails. This scene is supposed to lead up to Ariel's own grand reveal, how Sebastian conducts the concert for King Triton's daughters, excited for her debut to the public until it's revealed that she isn't actually there, worrying Sebastian and angering Triton in the moment before introducing her. And in the remake, they just point out she's not there for the choral or whatever meeting, questioning where she is, where it also really sets the tone for Javier Bardem's portrayal as the character, which I'm not a fan of. Comedy-wise, yes, 
success, but compared to the original in a serious manner, being the serious father really doesn't work. Because his acting as Triton is very lackluster, there is no power in his voice and he delivers lines like he would as Anton Shiger from No Country for Old Men, who is the villain of that movie. Which is actually one of my most favorite roles to date, but it's really not something you would expect who is a sporting character who is the father of the protagonist. Like throughout this movie, you will notice how that performance he gives it seems really quite odd and very similar to Anton with a softer voice overall. Not powerful or serious enough to really deliver the points well that the original had against his daughter. Where it even lacks compared to Javier's last big Disney role in Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales. Where he also played the villain in that being Salazar, who ironically enough also wielded a trident under the sea, but also had more emotion overall in his performance against Jack Sparrow. And sadly, this one really doesn't where it really decided we have to introduce Sebastian so that now he can go actually find her. Instead of that impact where it was supposed to be revealed originally where he actually got angry, where now it's just dragged so that we could suffer through this performance and David Diggs' Jamaican accent. I reminded her about the gathering just this morning. What more can one crustacean do? Like it really just feels too much at various points when he's on screen rather than the more balanced out tone Samuel E. Wright originally had for Sebastian's character. Your daughters, they will be spectacular! And of course, the fact he's also made worse once again because he's a ghost crap, so we have to look forward to that inaccuracy. But finally, this is where we get introduced to Ariel, exploring with Flounder the shipwreck to find things from the human world, to show us her character that is quite different from the rest of her family and the kingdom as a whole. Most of this is relatively staying the same from the original except the elongated intro for Ariel from her perspective, where throughout this remake we are constantly reminded that Hallie can sing. I mean it's wonderful and all but it kind of reminds you that she isn't great of an actor at certain points in the film. Like she does fine in certain scenes but like I said in my initial review she isn't very great in portraying Ariel in the speaking sense. How there are just so many moments where it really doesn't feel like she's Ariel in the sense of what her character is compared to that original portrayal by Jodie Benson that really gives life to the character that's being performed and it really becomes more noticeable the more you actually watch the film. And it's not helped by the fact that Flounder actually looks like this or is played by Jacob Tremblay, whose voice still provides absolutely nothing for a character who looks like this. One that is just similar to how we just had to go with the hyper-realistic animation for our animal characters in The Lion King and how they actually do not have any facial expressions or emotions at all. There is just no possible way that people can enjoy this when he looks like a real fish that has this blank expression all the time in the film compared to the original where you really need animation to suspend that disbelief to convince you that Ariel and Flounder can interact with each other. That you can actually feel the emotion on his face and his voice compared to this one that has actually none of the qualities of it. Jacob just does not do a really good job of conveying that especially with how Flounder was actually designed. It is just impossible to actually get on board with that because it's supposed to be real in all the senses. But evidently it's not actually the worst part of the scene where we move on to reintroduce Scuttle in this film. In the original, Ariel and Flounder actually travel to the surface to see Scuttle, a seagull that travels around and gives Ariel information about human inventions and whatnot about the world. But in the remake, they did something so stupid by making Scuttle into a gannet voiced by the infamous Aquafina, who dives underwater to tell her this news and whatnot. And the problem with this is how they kept Ariel underwater in this moment compared to how willingly she actually traveled to the surface to scuttle to find answers about what this fork is. That she sees this piece of silverware not knowing what it is exactly and how scuttle knows the answer because he's up there on the surface and it is actually her connection without actually or interacting with any humans. Directly disobeying the law her father imposes that keeps them beneath the surface far from human interaction. But in this one, scuttle just shows up out of nowhere diving to see Ariel where the ex explanation for this shit is that it is forbidden, that she can't do this in the scene because her father won't allow it. But comparing that to the original makes no sense because we already know it's clear that they can't go to the surface for being mermaids, but she just does it anyway and has been doing it for a while because she's just so curious about the human world, so much so that she willingly rebels against her father because it's what she wants to see and wants to do in her very life. Therefore making the original more progressive than what they tried to attempt to show for this very one, where this one is trying to be more independent pendant for Ariel, but the original one is actually doing a better job at doing so. Like why are you doing this at all when you pride yourselves on making this movie the sole reason to make her more empowered? Statements even Hallie herself actually said about the portrayal, from the stupid criticism about the first where many actually didn't understand the original film and Ariel's character stating that it's way bigger than that. It's about herself, her purpose, her freedom, her life and what she wants. As women we are amazing, we are independent, we are modern, we are everything and above 
and I'm glad Disney is updating some of those themes. But in updating those various themes, they also regressed her by doing this scene because it really doesn't establish her being independent at all, actually obeying her father's rules and not willingly going to the surface on her own to actually see this to interact with Scuttle. There is just clear intent they made in the original film that showcased more to her character than leaving the ocean for a boy like people stupidly say. It's just so stupid for anyone to mislook this because of how clear it was in the first place before she met Eric. And besides that, the relationship that Ariel has with Scuttle is also dumbed down, where there was really an enjoyment to Ariel's curiosity that Scuttle actually reveled in the fact that Ariel would come to him being the number one expert in humanity collecting these things and whatnot, that there was intent to the characters and it's shown to how much emotion and expressions they have. There is clear charm to the original Scuttle who balanced out at times being annoying and actually goofy rather than just Aquafina who is fully annoying. Not the worst thing she's ever done, but I can feel it. Like for some reason, Disney just loves Aquafina's performance as Sisu in their new genie in Raya and the Last Dragon, which was extremely annoying and dragged down by the poor trust message that the film has that the character Sisu actually does. Look how close my butt is to my head! That somehow they just found that so good they just had to cast her as the new Scuttle for some reason. Because Disney just loves to reuse their actors in the modern era because it's just that easy. And because of that and as a result, her performance as a character is just an annoying bird that feels like she's making shit up as she goes along rather than an actual informed, misinformed bird who misinterprets things. Like you really see how he shows the dingle hopper to Ariel and explains its use as a hair bus, but the remake instead just shows her underwater saying this and ripping out her own feathers, showcasing it like it's the first time she's actually used or seen it at all. Just a little twirl here and I yank down, boy oh like give it a little twirl, a little yank, you might get some pieces with it. And they covered this fact up by not giving her time to also talk about the smoking pipe she actually got, showcasing how lazy this film is overall because she's not given time to actually explain other things that Ariel actually found that was actually present in the original film. Ariel then gets reminded about music and the concert she was supposed to attend in the original that she was supposed to go but just got caught up in the human world too much, where they felt the need to have Sebastian back here as a character to remind her about the meeting rather than inferring from Scuttle about the original concert through music. It's a minor Trains, but one that is just lazily done to remind us that this ugly ass crab is a main character in the film, with such a forced to making accent that you just hate. I suppose you've completely forgotten tonight's the Carl Moon. Like the more you hear it each time he appears, the worse it gets because it doesn't really flow naturally and doesn't need to happen because we finally get introduced to Ursula. And like I said before, Melissa McCarthy's performance as Ursula really stood out to me as one of the better aspects of the film. Is it good? No, but at least it shows an attempt to match the original on her very part. And this is a fact where I'm a man who really isn't a fan of her work most of the time. I'm not sure if I've ever laughed at a Melissa McCarthy performance in my life or actually enjoyed anything she's done. I just couldn't actually get into it, but I actually found this to be the best she's ever done at this point. And the biggest change they made to her character was just making her the sister of King Triton, something that actually was in the original script of the animated movie, but just removed later on concerning the character. And the problem with this is the fact that it doesn't really make sense other than Disney constantly making their villains sympathetic for some reason, to find new ways to explain the iconic villains of the past in a more relatable sense, including making films where they are the main character and actually hero by that extent, which is actually very stupid. There is just no reason to do this because the film makes her a main threat from beginning to end. There is no redemption to her character because she constantly shows she is not worthy and mostly petty to what she wants to rule just because, angered at being banished because she was a sea witch and octopus to that extent if you know what I mean. It just doesn't make any logical sense for Merfolk and Taco to be related at all. No way that King Triton and Ursula could be siblings when it also brings up more questions about their own parents, even worse than King Triton's own multiracial daughters for some reason. How you understand how they find new ways to ruin their own film for the worse than any other remake only shielded by the fact of of course they're fictional creatures. Even if you can explain why they're the way they are for King Triton's daughters, it just doesn't make sense for the same for Ursula who clearly has a different biology from mermaids. But even if you say that, you also have to remember that the intention of these remakes are to be realistic depictions of their animated counterparts, not to make it 10 times more fake because that's actually very stupid. But don't worry, I'll get back to Ursula a bit later when they reintroduce her to Ariel because this is where we see Triton and Ariel's first interaction in the movie to set up the tone of the two characters from where they are at this very point. This is a scene that showcases the clear differences between the two for the worse because of how they were just built up. He is angry to find out 
the Ariel went to the shipwreck that is under the sea rather than flounder mentioning Scuttle who is above the surface. How they just decide to stick with being under the sea rather than up there that actually justifies his concern better in the original. Because in both versions it's very clear that they aren't allowed to go up to the surface because he thinks humans are dangerous and risky if she was actually seen by one. But instead the remake actually intends to show this by keeping her under, obeying the law her father sets rather than having her actually go up there for the better to showcase his concern. How you really don't feel the emotion between either Halley or Javier because it's not there, only using the shipwreck as the point for his argument to not going up there. Something that is actually relatively harmless because it's under the sea rather than his actual concern of knowing what is up there that she constantly goes to the surface to learn about the world where you know she can be clearly spotted in bright daylight by ships and any humans who watches. How you can justify this version being more empowering and modern to her character because she does things that disobeys the law. But if you don't allow her to do that and if you show us something that lacks in emotion compared to their animated interactions, then how can you feel their concerns in this scene when she's not allowed to do that at all if she obeys that rule rather than actually breaks it? For instance, take a look at King Triton's argument in both scenes and try to tell which one is more effective. As long as you live under my ocean, you'll obey my rules. But as long as you live in my ocean, you'll obey my rules. As you can clearly see, the original one is more effective because of how angry he gets laying down the rules on Ariel, which clearly affects her compared to the remake where it just really feels like it's hardly there at all. No emotion whatsoever in the vocal and facial performance and the removal of lines considering where they set the story up from before. Because Triton states that Ariel is never to go to the surface again and clearly almost makes her cry. How we get to see two sides of emotion being displayed in anger on Triton and sadness on Ariel so that she can storm off from and how this version barely raises his voice in a more neutral tone and how Ariel just stares at him and leaves. She has the hint of sadness but it's not on the verge of actual tears like the original and it doesn't actually make you feel for her as a result. You can feel sadness for her for what she wants but not as much as what they actually had when you actually saw her father yell at her that actually made her visibly upset. These minor details are what elevates the story and characters that so many actually refuse to understand about the original where when you do notice that then you can appreciate what they did originally and how badly they butchered the characters overall. There's just clearly more intent to her character introduced rather than how people perceive her as just leaving the ocean for a boy where the scenes with her father and her curiosity really shows those points very well. But everything in this film instead just hands that down to her to explore instead. She really doesn't have the agency to go for what she wants because she also wants to respect her father's wishes and hand those important plot points down on a plate because she also wants to respect her father's wishes and law which reduces the impact of this very moment. A moment that leads us into her most famous song being of course part of your world after Sebastian is tasked by Anton over here to watch Ariel. There's no better way you can serve me than to make sure my little one stays out of trouble. Friendo. We see how she's contemplating how her father could see the human world being bad when they actually can create wonderful things like dingo hoppers and so forth. And this is one of the moments that actually allows Halley to shine as Ariel, the proof that she showed that she was being worthy of the character despite the circumstances around her. Because she really does well to capture most of the magic that Jodie actually performed for her originally in the singing form. In its essence without the film, it's a very phenomenal performance. But it's also not without its issues in the very direction of the film. She has the charm of the character but is constantly mixed throughout delivering lines so poorly compared to the one we all know. Because there is something very special to how she is actually singing that actually pertains to the way her character is, what we learn and what she wants that is properly communicated to the audience. How you can feel the emotion she is going through to connect with a world she can't be a part of that sets up her entire story that we are supposed to go through. The animation also straightens this to how she actually moves around the cavern and how Ariel herself is actually feeling. How she is so desperate and excited to learn more about this world. One example here is when she talks about the thing Thingamabobs. You want thingamabobs? I got 20. You can see and infer here that she's excited about these things, showing the of flounder and whatnot, where in the remake the direction shows something else that lacks in that very emotion and acting. You want thingamabobs? I got 20. In this version, she shows Flounder the same thingamabobs but now done in a very tired way. Like, look, I got this man, isn't that enough for you? That type of expression. Instead of the original being overall excited for having things that really don't mean much to us overall as utensils and whatnot, and then sad again that no one would actually notice when she hunches down and looks up wanting more. The animation just shows you more details to how she actually longs for this rather than the remake elongating this unnecessary to show off her skills in the singing department. Because in a point brought up by your movie sucks in his review of this very movie, there's just a clear emotional moment for Arrow to do when she sings to be a part of her world. How in this part she stops singing but also speaks the lyric. Out of the sea, wish I could be. 
It shows how much she longs for this in her emotional state, but it's also ruined in the remake by how much they wanted Hallie to show off her singing, elongated this moment that ruins the emotional state expressed to the audience. And although most people wouldn't actually mind or notice this because they like her singing, knowing this fact alone really ruins the moment that shows what she's actually going through. Instead of acting to show what she's really feeling that she can't attain, it's covered off by this show off singing that really doesn't understand the point of why it's being conveyed in the first place, the stuff you need to do in musical theater. Something that actually Howard Ashman himself actually intended when you see the footage of him directing Jody to how he actually wanted the song to be performed in his own lyric. Think of yourself working more with more intimately, working more intimately with Robbie or with the mic or with okay. whatever, but think of it as a smaller room. So not as breathy, but yet not high quality. Like you're talking like, yeah. Okay. I want to be where the people are. What would I give if I could live out of these waters? The intensity mm -hmm. is better than, what would I give is better than, than, than noise. Moment. Yeah, but they're not doing it from them. It's, but it's it's inner intensity. So even there. more, not as singing, mm -hmm. basically. Let, use less voice and more intensity. Okay. Just get in okay. on yourself. Get yourself get yourself in the place you're in, in, in the big emotional scenes after that. Okay. Music, for me anyway, is information. It's a way to get character and plot information across. So you want music to be information. You want it to develop story or character in some way. So the song will carry its own weight justifies existence This footage shows us the clear direction that he wanted the song to be performed and how it was in the final product that we all see. How he was telling Jody in these clips to how he wanted the feelings to be communicated for the character from the heart compared to how it's just clearly singing in the newer version. The reason everything was built up this way in the film is because that is what Howard intended in the first place to how Ariel and her character was rather than singing because it's a song. Because it's more than just that. His lyrics were intended for something greater in the moment for Ariel character and they forgot that point. How everything in song flowed cohesively to how she was feeling especially when she says wandering free in both versions. Wandering free, wish I could be. Wandering free, wish I could be. This is also something that clearly shows the lack of skill or direction to how these two were actually developed. How the animated one paused to speak but also flowing well with the song to how they tried to do that. But her acting just wasn't good enough and caused it to pause abruptly. How it really chokes you out of the moment by how she's just saying wandering free because they wanted to capture what the original had without actually knowing why they did it at all. Focusing more on the singing aspect rather than the acting aspect that is supposed to supplement that moment. You are supposed to focus on how the character is actually feeling rather than how the song is actually being performed. And if you don't do that, then you don't have the emotions that are supposed to drive the story forward. The moment where she gets curious about what is happening going up to the surface again. Or of course, the first time she actually did it in this version of the movie. Finally doing something she already did much earlier in the film. It's a moment that sucks compared to the original because of how she really didn't actually go up at first when she was supposed to like we already seen. Only now just happening because it's supposed to happen in the film where she has to rescue Eric eventually from the storm that's supposed to happen. How it really did nothing to actually earn that moment because she obeyed her father compared to how she already did it herself and still disobeying him where she went up to see what is happening and finding Eric for the first time. Her connection with him is just very clear because he's a human Odyssey and finds charm in his personality with the other crew. And I'm not going to spend too much time on the differences because the entire part is relatively the same again except for this singular fact that they added on to the characters that Eric is actually adopted in the kingdom he lives on which is stupid and something we'll explore a little bit later on because it adds nothing to his character contrasting to Ariel who clearly isn't adopted, even if her sisters look totally different. A major point of this remake is to really develop their characters more to showcase much more of Eric's side and personality as one. But the things they add are totally unnecessary overall compared to the minimalism the original had that was actually fine on its own if you understand what the real story was doing compared to its idiotic criticism. It's not completely bad but it's ruined by these unnecessary changes in between. There are certain moments that are actually good that I want to mention that it actually adds to its original character, but just ruined overall by what else is being added that doesn't actually make the film better in any way. But beyond that, for this and for the most part, this scene is relatively still the same and nothing really added much except to how bland the background is in the version compared to the animated ones, where despite being a little dark, it still highlights everything in the moment much more and how Scuttle is actually helpful in the original trying to see if Eric is alive rather than appearing there because they really cannot have Flounder appearing too much because that would actually be 
leave revolting. How Scuttle is just there like that to remind us the annoying comic relief that is presented by Aquafina rather than one who showcases his worth as a character knowing the human world to a certain extent, even if that extent is wrong in all levels. Just how this one is just there because of comedy rather than being helpful. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Yes. Uh... Yes, I just love the sass they add to the character because it's really adding something new to the film that wasn't there before. Yes, girl, slay. Like, why have a helpful seagull when you can have a valley girl Gannett? I just love this film and everything they do. It's just so great and it doesn't ruin anything at all because Disney is a great company that clearly gets what Walt Disney wanted 60 years ago. Like, this is truly the culmination of his life's work. Good job, guys. But anyways, this moves us back to our next song set up in Under the Sea, everyone's most favorite song in the entire film. The difference here is how it establishes Ariel falling in love with Eric, clearly seen different by her father and sisters at this point before the actual song, where in the remake it just has to happen after the song because they need to explore Eric a bit more, hence the longer painful runtime the movie has. The original one is better in this case because it establishes her love of humans that she just connected with when he saved her, where her father was actually in view without knowing what she loved specifically and how Sebastian already saw this and must attempt to get her to like where she lives rather than showing us talking to Ariel for the most part after Ursula discovers this fact. This buildup is much more worse because of the explanation of what they are connected with. The first visit to the surface in the movie when Ariel actually says this before the song starts. The ship rode on the wind and they filled the sky with fire. Okay. What the hell is this writing? Like seriously, why did they actually choose to write this down for the scene? Because it really sounds awful rather than hopeful as they might have actually thought. Filling the sky with fire actually paints a darker hellish picture rather than a very gleeful heavenly one. Like that doesn't actually make sense. The only reason it could have been written like this is because they tried to focus more on Ariel's independence rather than her love for Eric that is seen in the original. How she actually explains her love of Eric but now this version is trying to explain more of the human world. Because before the song starts, she discusses how she's going to meet Eric, that he already knows what happened but is trying to convince her to stay her down for her father's sake, where if you wanted to communicate those points to why she likes the human world rather than just Eric, then don't just try to write something so stupid like filling the sky with fire to convince Sebastian because it just sounds wrong and dangerous to do so. You are not convincing anyone that you are right by doing this at all and then convincing people like Sebastian that the human world are very dangerous. It really just feels like these decisions come straight from executive Disney rather than the writers themselves where they tell them what to write about rather than they actually adapting the story to what was. For all of this actually happened way before the writer's strike, but constantly just feels like a product by how stupid it actually all sounds, something that could be AI generated with no emotion whatsoever. But sadly, that writing isn't even the stupidest part of the scene where there is even more egregious mistakes to how the song Under the Sea itself is presented. One where we see the steps Sebastian has to take to convince Ariel to stay rather than go. How you can actually find the charm in the animation to how it begins rather than the forced realism that tries to convince you that this is believable at all, which it really isn't as seen by a smile he has while he's singing. Fucking creepy as hell. The major difference you notice at first is how open the remake is to how the world and the water is actually shown. The sea is expansive and only allows Ariel and Sebastian to stick out the most when the point of the song is actually to show the many sea creatures that the ocean has to offer. They do show the creatures around them, but they aren't the actual main focus of the entire song to compare to how the original song was actually designed with them in mind as that's very central point. The main problem that the first one shows is how they don't actually allow the other fish to sing except Sebastian himself, how he has to show Ariel with the others about what happens up there that is bad compared to down here, beginning with the fish that has a deep voice to explore. One day when the boss get yes, be on the this is meant to showcase the gravity of what is happening with humans and fish and how dark and low it gets, where instead in the remake they decide to do something else with Sebastian to sing it all instead, then they make David Deeks do all the work and it doesn't work as seen here. One day when the boss get hungry, guess who gonna be on the plate? Like, why are you doing this? He clearly doesn't have the voice to communicate that point that that original fish had and you are just forcing one character to say a line designed with another character in mind. There is no reason to solely focus on these two because that is not the part of the song. The point of the song is Sebastian focusing on what the sea brings that the surface really doesn't offer at all. And just like part of your world, this song really forgets the intention of what is 
is being brought in the first place. This is where you really see why animation is very important because it's conveying what the lyrics are stating for real to showcase us things pertaining to the song that wouldn't be possible without some great effort in reality, which this scene really doesn't have at all. Nothing in this scene is real except Hallie herself. Once again, they do have other creatures in the scene, but they are more background to the focus rather than the highlight. They don't have anything to offer because they try to stick to their real biology, which actually means that they have no real expressions for them whatsoever, like the Lion King itself. And to really highlight this problem is in the bridge of the song where Sebastian lays out all the creatures and what they do. As you can see here, he's listing things off in the song without anything happening except Ariel bouncing up and down with sea turtles and how other creatures are just dancing as much as their biology allows. I was just there and how it pales into comparison about what it was adapting and the reason it was there as seen in the original. These lyrics are designed to show what is going on under the sea and the animation is actually designed to actually help with that point for real matching what is actually being said. That there is a point to why the lyrics are being sung rather than being there for the sake of it that the remake actually is doing. Nothing is being warranted for its existence because they don't want to show it. Thinking it's there because it's catchy rather than having a literal purpose to it. The only thing kept from that purpose is the end part where the blowfish actually blows up and that's it. And the thing to add about this, I really just don't like how we emphasize blowfish blow part because the original one actually did it naturally within the flow of the song that's being told, that's being excited, rather than just shouting it out to replace what lackluster action is going on. Like how can you give any reason to why it's being sung if you actually can't show it? That you can't show what lyrics are being said in scenes that continue as seen here. Like why are you removing that intention at all, other than being realistic to not actually have it in your already 250 million dollar plus film. The budget in this film actually doesn't make any sense with how little is actually going on in scenes like this. And you really can't justify this by the fact that your creatures have no facial expressions at all because they really don't have that biologically. You still have to show it to actually make sense to what is being shown in the first place where they really keep constantly reminding you that Hallie can actually sing because she repeats the chorus after Sebastian for some reason as seen here. <laughs> This shouldn't happen because its focus is on Sebastian himself convincing her throughout and he really doesn't need her input in the song. I mean it's not completely wrong to do this as seen in 2019 when Disney actually did a tribute to the film with a live musical performance starring my fellow Hawaiian Ali'i Cravalho, or as most people know her as Moana herself, where she actually performed as Ariel in this play in a performance with Jamaican rapper Shaggy as Sebastian, one where she actually sang in Under the Sea. As we can see here, she is actually singing a part of the song but actually adding her own addition as Don't Want To Be rather than actually having the film have Hallie repeat what is being sung. How you can actually have her sing but have it go against what is being sung as that is what happens when Flounder allows her to escape to see something. It's a very minor point but it just sets up more to her character better than what is just doing it be just because. To make up for removing things that don't need to be removed at all. It's just stupid how you just make her sing in this moment because it adds completely nothing to the song at all. She's clearly not interested in anything Sebastian is saying because she's clearly interested at the human world and Eric. It's also stupid how they don't show that when she actually goes while Sebastian is busy. How she was actually enjoying the song but is just gone right thereafter. How she's just gone two seconds after the song ends. They really just don't communicate things properly time to time. Just show us where her priorities lie when the crab is actually caught up in his own song. Disney. That's how it's supposed to work, by not working for Sebastian in an end and how it's actually shown to us. It just doesn't make sense for her to disappear within two seconds of the song being end. That is just illogical and inconsistent on your part. But that's not even the worst part considering the lyrics weren't even changed for these songs but the ones we actually see later on important to the story events and the new ones they decided to add to the film. But anyways, this part leads us back to the addition of Eric's background exploring more of his character and where he grew up. Mentioning once 
again that he's adopted, raised by Queen Selina of the Caribbean Island Kingdom. I don't really like this because it's not really where the story should be taking place concerning the original novel, where it would be by Denmark more closely and the fact that Eric is not blood related to the throne at all. I mean, it's not a bad thing that it does take place in the Caribbean because I like that kind of vibe, but it's just how, you know, blends things that don't match up with how the Little Mermaid actually worked originally. How adding these things aren't really necessary to his character at all despite adding more to his background to why he loves the sea. It isn't bad, but it's just adding too much that doesn't actually need to be there than what was already known. Extending a film longer than it needs to be compared to how Cinderella's remake was actually roughly the same length as the original film but a little bit longer and still added things to explain the story more to a bit more being better without ruining the experience overall. He just really doesn't need to be adopted because that's not the point when you're just trying to connect with someone clearly born on land with someone born on sea. But that's just my opinion and I think that most people would actually find this entire point and background find overall, except for the new song. And this is something Disney has been keeping on doing for most of their remakes, adding these new solo songs for characters that never really got that in the original and now do to actually make up and add something new to their story that actually wasn't there. But this really adds nothing to what we already know. It's more unnecessary than the previous songs, but actually still in the middle of all at least, between the horrendous tonally awful Jasmine song and the actual decent evermore that the beast sings. It's just a song that is just there to pad out the runtime and that's it. Not really attempting to actually add anything new for his character than what has already been shown and just explained in song form. I had almost drowned till you came around and you found me. I mean, I wouldn't mind it as much if they actually sticked more to the original as what we see later on to when he is supposed to actually meet Ariel for the first time, but he actually doesn't because that is where another original Lin-Manuel Miranda song actually plays. I mean, this is where you actually realize they were also planning to give King Triton a song also, but that would actually make things 10 times worse knowing what has already happened here. They're just adding too much while providing too little for the story than what needs to be told. These songs just add nothing than what we've already been shown and explained. I'm just not sure exactly what you're supposed to learn here when I already acquired that information before this point other than the fact you want to keep the movie drabbed and depressed with these grey skies constantly. You want to suck the life out of the film that is supposed to be teeming with actual life rather than fictionally animated ones. And this is something that transitions us back to the scene similar to the one I said before, before Under the Sea actually started that I mentioned earlier with Ariel and her sisters and her very father. And boy, this actually shows that the animation does sure look horrendous. Like seriously guys, this is the best they could actually do on a 250 million dollar budget? You think that any of this, the way that Ariel looks or any of her sister looks is actually compelling or interesting compared to Avatar that came out like 6 months before? You best be thanking God a lot right now Disney for making this over 566 million dollars at the box office because there was clearly a chance it couldn't have even broken even at all and actually lost money for shit like this. This is also where you discover that all of Ariel's sisters have accents also along to go with what race they are actually are. British sisters, Indian Indian sisters, Russian sisters, Spanish sisters, just you name the accent and that's what's actually going on along with American Ariel. But the point about the scene is just about King Triton finding out what Ariel has been hiding, trying to instill that humans are still dangerous leading up to the event where he finds out what she has been doing in her cave or grotto. This scene originally was set off by King Triton finding out through Sebastian about what she had been doing. Oh, he slipped talking about humans which set his anger off to find out what exactly Ariel has been thinking this entire time. How you can feel his rage finding this out and how once again Javier just really doesn't convey that compared to that just saying humans like an old geezer would. <laughs> How they constantly mix scenes from the first to add in new ones and the flow gets ruined. The point of this scene is where Flounder was showing Ariel Eric's statue for the first time, but the remake showed us that before the under the sea part instead of her talk with her sister. It just really doesn't add up to how you're supposed to feel in the moment moving all over the place, joined together at random moments where Triton hides behind Eric's statue in the remake instead of coming out from the shadow to convey his darker anger towards Ariel. This is the most important moment in both because it shows how they contrast hard and how the remake sucks to how the acting is performed. King Triton is angry at his daughter for disobeying the rules he constantly sets and wants to teach her a lesson. How it is clear in emotion in the voice acting and animation that he really demands Ariel to understand him like a stern father should and how Javier Bardem is not giving any of the emotion to that at all. And neither is Hallie for the most part to what she is supposed to show for Ariel getting upset and sad, being frightened at her father's behavior. It is just constantly soft on both sides where it feels more like Anton Chigurh once again by his tone rather than the almighty 
navigate King Triton of the Seven Seas. How you understand the emotions where both sides are coming from and you barely have that at all. Halle as Ariel in the scene is doing the minimum looking concerned but not really doing much else even in her own voice that contrasts with the animated Ariel where Jodie Benson's voice conveys what she is clearly feeling while still trying to get through to her father. Nothing is built up in either of the performances and it's one of the worst that the film has to offer no matter how hard you spin it. That the direction is trying to aim once again is not focusing on Ariel's love of Eric but herself and it's not really quite working as well as they would like. Like how Dee delivers lines like this. Compassionate and kind. He's a human. You're a mermaid. Do you really think I'm convinced that he's remotely angry or trying to get through to his daughter, saying lines like he's 80 years old or something like this? And why is Ariel not trying to raise her voice to make her point more clear like the original? Why is this direction so shit? Please, just give us something to feel that warrants this moment that is supposed to hurt her character emotionally by how he doesn't understand this or refuses to understand what his daughter actually wants. Because the original actually did this very well to how it actually leads to this moment, earned by how he set off knowing that Ariel loves Eric, that she chose to love a human in this scene right here. Daddy, I love him! <laughs> This shows how you can really feel and see the emotion to how she actually cares about Eric and the human world and how it actually shocks her father knowing she's done something wrong in his eyes, knowing a race that he deems to be evil without question. So be it. It is earned in this moment because of what is known before compared to the remake that has none of that and only spurned off by not answering his question like this. I swear I will get through to you. Nothing about this was actually earned or felt at all compared to what I just said and showed in that very animated film. It just happens like that and no question or emotion built up to it whatsoever starting to destroy what Ariel had actually collected to get his point across and what he believes with no reason. How it really affects her for the worst by how it's lit and how it's actually portrayed that breaks her down crying in the end because of what he's ruined that she actually loves. That she showed emotion caring about him that is earned in the scene in its entirety but just done in this shallow way because they couldn't actually somehow get this out of their actors. Like what I mentioned before in some of the songs, if you can't do this then why do it at all? Why make this when it shows nothing that should be happening that was there in the first place? Because they continuously forget about what made this scene special by making Triton more colder and villainous than the original by how he leaves Ariel without any emotional regret like he did in this scene. Never leave again. Just stating that to never leave again and just leaving. Like a heartless father who never actually cared about his children at all. Because the original film actually shows he clearly regrets this but does so to teach her this lesson he thinks is important to her. Seeing her cry and leaving her with sadness that she would eventually get over it. Knowing that he's hurt her daughter to some extent trying to think that it's actually for the better and none of that actually exists anymore where he actually just doesn't care or shows it at all. He didn't care when he started it because it was not set up by what she said at all and neither cared after when she clearly is in distress, which to be fair she didn't actually show that very well herself either. All of this shows is a clear level of ignorance to how the story actually worked in the first place, never really wanting to add anything for the better, constantly doing the remake problem of removing every single important piece to why these films were special to begin with. How you really need to see that otherwise they will constantly get away with it every single time with how many people actually love this film without noticing the real problems that degrades animation as a medium. The best form of storytelling that allows so many things where it is clear the live action film cannot. They attempt to do something that wasn't designed the way it was and it lacks the heart and charm of what the movie already provided in the first place, leaving us on this note of despair and not in the right way for the story introducing Ariel to finally Ursula earlier than it should actually happen. Because for some reason in this film they decided to not have the eels Flotsam and Jetsam actually talk at all. They are still there, mostly used similar to the original, but they just don't talk at all for some reason mainly to focus on Ursula directly with Ariel instead, which is actually very dumb. Like why have Flounder and Sebastian talk at all if you don't do it for the rest of the characters under the sea? I understand now it's anti-Ursula if that actually makes sense like her sisters, but you really should utilize most of the characters more with the runtime you have. Removing character from the original takes away most of the meaning they had rather than just being a vessel or two for others, because Flotsam and Jetsam were the darlings of Ursula in the original and now to reduce them as realistic CGI eels is very pathetic. It's more of another way to try to be somewhat sympathetic for Ursula's character and what she is in relation to Ariel rather than the sassy villain of the original. Her grand entrance and reveal to her protagonist is effectively gone for this and now has a reduced impact. And the same thing can go for the creatures that were formerly merfolk or poor unfortunate souls in this case as she would call it, replaced by these other sea creatures to make it somehow scary to introduce us to her formally, to show us the dark cavern that she actually probably 
shock some of the kid audience. The problem with doing this is how it really doesn't add the consequences that Ariel is getting into considering what these people are suffering living next to Ursula as we see what she deals with later on. Where instead, the remake actually decides to continue with a sympathetic angle because they decide to make her more related to her and Triton being her auntie and trying to show her background that never actually needed to be explored just like everything else. Because the original is more short to the point, quicker to what she actually wants in the song Poor Unfortunate Souls, establishing that she is a dealmaker willing to help Ariel reach the handsome Prince Eric or just becoming a human in the case of a remake. Because you know, you gotta be more sensitive to the times being more empowering to females. But the more important thing to talk about here is the song Poor Unfortunate Souls itself, the first major song where they change or remove some of the lyrics. The song starts similar where you really notice how hard Melissa McCarthy is trying to replicate Pat Carroll's performance, where despite being one of the better aspects of the film, she really isn't the best at doing so either. This song is made to persuade Ariel that her deals aren't bad and benefits the poor unfortunate souls she actually helps. And what I really want to highlight here is the original in Pat Carroll's phenomenal performance as Ursula, which was in fact her very first villain role, where before that point she had actually been acting since 1947 and won several awards including an Emmy Award and actually played Ursula up until her death in 2022. It's a neat fact to learn where various videos of her actually showcase her love of the role when she attended several events really embracing it fully, how we get to see that talent shine in her voice and acting ability and sing, one where she also won a Grammy Award, mind you. And everything Melissa McCarthy is doing instead is actually trying to capture that very energy that she displayed on the vocal performance but ultimately actually failing to do so. She's trying to match Pat Carroll's deeper voice but is not able to do so at all, straining to actually try to perform that and it clearly shows. This shows how important casting decisions are when it comes to characters and how acting and singing and musical theater are very different things. It's why most Disney Renaissance films had two voice actors for each of the main character, the ones that can act and the ones that can sing, knowing the elements that can work if you can actually find a direction and people that are capable of delivering it to do so, easy to get away with an animation that makes the character into its own that you're believing that they are capable of actually performing these numbers and actually acting the way that they are. Where luckily enough, in the original film, our main characters were already performing in musical theater, making them capable of actually acting and singing, but this one is filled with people who excel at one thing rather than the other and how that point cannot be remedied just because it's a live action film. How Melissa cannot hit those notes properly to the song because she really isn't capable of doing so and going back to the other characters performing tasks really meant for others but replace the fill in quicker. How Hallie can actually sing very well but she's not actually acting very well either for the most part. It just doesn't make sense because those elements are lacking in the charm that was originally there that was performed well because they knew the roles that needed to be directed to create an actual story. But besides that, there is also the main direction problem to how it's performed and how the song is shown again, seen in the line to how she's used her magic to help people. And here lately, please don't laugh, I use it on behalf of the miserable, lonely, and depressed path. This shows her real attitude to the people she actually helps, thinking them to actually be pathetic as she whispers to Flotsam and Jetsam the reality behind Ariel's and the merfolk's back. But in the remake, it does something like this. Of the miserable, lonely, and depressed. Who the hell is she exactly talking to? Why did you decide to make it this way out in the open when Ariel is actually right there in front of her? The point of this is to show how she really feels as the villain and not show this to the protagonist at all to try to convince them that this deal will work for them. Not this, you fucking idiots. There is a reason why it's being performed that way because that was the intention of the direction. There is no reason why she would be doing this when you clearly can do what the animated film do and turn to the side to say this, to slightly go behind the backs of what is in front of you to express this because that was clearly the intention of what they did originally. But they constantly forget everything that went into doing so and everything that they created from Howard Ashman to Muskegon and Clements and so forth with the animators themselves. And this leads us back to into the lyrics of the song, with the removal of the line in the song relating to the deal that Ursula had concocted for her, the one where she has to remove her voice for three days in order to become human. It's something clearly said in both films where they pause to talk about that before she sings, to get Ariel that can be sealed by true love's kiss, otherwise she will belong to Ursula. And of course because of this, Ariel is unsure because she doesn't understand how she would be able to interact with people without her own voice. Where to answer that, Ursula gives this simple, villainous answer that was actually shown here in the very lyrics itself that I will state for you in order to protect myself from copyright, where she sings this. The men up there don't like a lot of blabber, they think a girl who gossips is a bore. Yes on land it's much preferred for ladies not to say a word, after all dear what is idle prattle for. Come on they're not all impressed with 
conversation. True gentlemen avoid it when they can, but they dote and swoon and fawn on a lady who's withdrawn, it's she who holds the tongue who gets a man. What Ursula is doing is trying to convince Ariel that this is a good thing, that this bad thing is actually beneficial to what she's trying to get, that having no voice wouldn't matter through the use of body language to how beautiful she already is and how she already likes to gaslight Ariel into thinking that men don't want women who talk, which of course she knows she wants the man. A man who clearly doesn't think that way at all. Because the reason they removed this is because they were being sensitive to modern times and to women overall. Ellen Menken had to actually explain this and why Kiss the Girl were changed because the culture has gotten sensitive to how this feels forced against females and they want to be more encouraging to them instead. But by doing so, completely negates what he and Howard Ashman actually wrote for the characters in the first place in the original who clearly weren't that way at all. He said that they removed this because they wanted to encourage women to be more vocal even though this clearly comes from the main villain of the fairy story. That it's clear that the, her deal is not a good one and that she is a liar and a big manipulator who shouldn't be trusted obviously at all where anyone with a brain can actually see through that disguise. These lyrics were written to showcase her evil ways that aren't true in the slightest when you take the rest of the film into context. There is a clear reason for it being there and it's only done mainly because Disney wants to profit out of everything in modern times and try to respect other people's opinions and sensitivities now rather than make a story to how it's designed and how it's actually being told. It's stupid to remove these things because it lessens the songs, considering what almost actually happened with Be Prepared in The Lion King which newer lyrics also suck compared to the original. Like they say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, especially if it's a villain song. Stop removing the villain songs Disney, it's stupid because most people already know that they are the bad guys and will not follow their words at all. Just let them have their moments that are clearly bad in intention. But then again, it doesn't matter to the whole movie because she's still able to get her point across because she doesn't want to go back to her father at this point, traveling up to the surface to become a human. And what makes this worse is what follows actually after, where Ursula actually explains that she put a cheat on the spell that is causing to forget that she needs to kiss Eric. She won't remember she needs to get that kiss. That the main point of her going to the surface and actually making this contract and deal and being there is to exactly do that and that's clear in the original. But once again wanting to focus on what she wants herself in the female empowerment message and trying to make her look villainous in other ways other than the sympathetic ones where we have to forget that point to cause some stakes in our plot. But what they don't realize about doing this is how it gives no purpose to why Ariel should be up there at all when her connection is with Eric, the one that connected her to humanity in the first place that she actually wants to be part of this that she saved and wants to actually know them. And without that part, it actually removes the point of what is being there at all. But they clearly just don't go with that intention of actually adapting a story. They just make it for money overall instead, which almost didn't actually work at all. And above all, you shouldn't be cheating this because even villains know what level they actually have to play against the hero. And doing this is such a cop-out that forgets that our foes at least uphold a bargain to their points. That they don't play easy because that's not how a fucking story works, dumbass. But anyways, besides Besides that, they decide to start her new life by putting her on a boat rather than closer to shore because they need to do something that is called a new SOMG, also known as Song. Because the original actually had her close to Eric on the beach which he yearns for and needs the kiss to work, where this one instead sets her on a journey where this fisherman has to take her to the castle so they know what to do with her, which is honestly very stupid. Instead of meeting him automatically, we need a new Lin-Manuel Miranda song that adds nothing to the story at all and actually makes things worse. How they remove some of the other songs of the original and place new ones here instead to match the tone of the new movie that they're laying out. And this song is truly pathetic because of what it exactly it's actually doing, making Ariel sing when she can't even speak. And they tried to hide this by the fact that it's actually going on in her head, but it still doesn't work overall because we can clearly hear it and they use it to make the most out of Hallie's singing ability rather than her acting ability. It's not inherently a bad song, there's a lot to like on its own, being the first time and whatever, but what it's actually doing again is not necessary and actually a very bad thing in the context of the original and the events of the film. And the lyrics are actually pretty dumb when you think about it pertaining to scenes like this and what had actually come before. Are we only food for 
reason I highlight this very lyric is because of how stupid it is forgetting what Scuttle actually did in front of Ariel and everything that actually happens under the sea. That she and Flounder actually never minded at all when she actually ate a fucking fish in front of them. But now all of a sudden you're just seeing this and now you're questioning if we we're just food for slaughter? Like why are you bringing this up even though it's already been shown that she's a mermaid and sees other fish and animals that actually eat fish from before? Like doesn't that shark interaction mean anything to you? Why should this be a surprise that she's seeing humans actually cooking fish or whatnot when she's actually seen that before under the sea? Like none of this is actually very necessary to explore because she doesn't have a voice at all. Never mind her inside one in her head, she can't speak at all and the original movie actually knew this and took advantage of the fact happening until she gets her voice back. That is actually clear to the audience that she has no voice to actually speak but you just ruined it by actually giving her one after she really lost it. And it's also made worse by the fact that we see this in the song itself in the sequence where she's clearly singing in the moment, opening her mouth and doing it. I mean it's not literally in real time and it's still in her head in a way, but it's actually showing the audience this very motion that she's moving her lips and actually singing when it's actually not possible to do so. The point of this entire part of the movie is how she can't speak and now you're actually making her do something that she can't physically do at all to that very audience and it's not good. How exactly are they this tone deaf to what movie they are actually adapting and the choices they made? It doesn't make any sense despite me saying this for the millionth time. They are just doing the worst possible options with each new decision each time the film goes on and they don't stop doing it at all. Like my goodness this movie sucks really hard, why can't you just understand this? And it's heartbreaking because the first interaction they have is pretty tame and not very connectable at all like the original one. That did, despite her not speaking being the girl he was looking for, that he still cared for her and actually took her in at the kindness of her own heart and where he likes to go. That he showed that he cares about people even if it wasn't the ones he's looking for girl wise. But instead, in this version, it has him go with the servants who after building this moment up after the song, it's just like, oh, you're not the girl I was looking for, well, this is disappointing. Hey guys, just make sure she's actually treated up well since she doesn't actually have a place to live. Well we're glad you've made it to us, and you're welcome to stay here. It's just overall disappointing in the way it was actually presented, up from this moment compared to where we just started meeting for the first time on the beach. How despite her not being able to speak, he still took the initiative to see that she would be cared for by himself. That he actually stepped in directly instead of what they were doing at this moment with his servant. It may not be the woman that I love, but I will ensure that she gets provided with whatever she needs. I'm not saying this Eric is cold hearted because he clearly cares and actually wants to see her get sick. Safe, but it's just that the original one actually does this better and has him interact with Ariel much better. I get that they want a bigger intro for him to be together to develop, but this intro is just so much better for his character to actually connect with her in the first place rather than leaving them both dry at their very first meeting in disappointment. And why should we actually care about her initial excitement about this in meeting Eric? She's the one who's being cheated on to forget to kiss him in the first place making everything about this so pointless guys. Like seriously, you don't have to include that scene in where Ursula cheats in that moment. You don't have to do that. You could just do the original version and not actually lose anything at all because it's part of her character. And this is where things drastically split up for the most part from the original, where the films have different ways to how to interact before Kiss the Girl actually starts. The original one is where she gets invited to dinner as his guest, where this one is where she's curious about the castle stumbling into Eric's collection that was similar to her own in a very human way, which is kind of cheap in actual practice being two sides of the same point, but also not bad at all. It's fine to showcase more of his side that is evidently similar to Ariel's at this point, to show more of his own character in a more logical manner rather than just being adopted. That just shows more than what they actually had originally that actually gave more time rather than rushing over some of the moments in the original. And generally, this is one of the scenes that are actually a good way to show those interactions. It's one of those rare moments that a remake does something that I actually like in a way and I don't really hate it at all. And this isn't also to say that the original isn't good either, because there are certainly funny moments to actually enjoy like Le Poissons, which was also sadly removed from this version of the film, and how Ariel actually interacts with things like Scuttle actually told about her, which everyone also appears to be confused by, like using Forks as Dinglehopper and so forth. So overall, both versions actually do very interesting and neat ways to actually present to actually connect the main characters together in their own way. But I still can't enjoy this version to how the circumstances are based around Ariel actually forgetting that she needs to kiss Eric as discovered by Sebastian, all of them just wandering aimlessly 
with no real goal unlike the original that was clear from the start. When she reaches that point, she just forgets that she's supposed to do this. This is absolutely stupid. And this leads us to the more elongated scene of the original of Ariel actually exploring the town and what humans actually virtually do. Another actual decent addition that explores more of what she would actually want to see and one that would actually been better if they hadn't actually done the first time song because it actually adds more without having her unnecessarily sing when she doesn't actually have a voice. And yeah, for the most part, it hits the major beats that actually happened before in the first but a little bit longer, using the town scene after the carriage ride rather than before where it really shows more of it and the interactions that the people of this kingdom have. It gives more personality to them rather than actually being there for the sake of being there to show Ariel that. And that's something to appreciate in the original to how much Ariel is actually enjoying everything about the human world. That it isn't just about loving Eric as well, it's about loving humanity what they have to offer in her life that she yearned for at the very beginning. The driving force behind everything that was being able to be a part of even before Eric entered that very picture. Eric was a major addition that she could connect with with being a teenager and so forth where this is fine enough to actually add more without ruining everything as well. Well, that except for the fact it takes place in the Caribbean, which I'll dive in a bit more. Because this comes with the obligatory cameo with the original actors, a kind of cheap passing of the torch many times for other remakes, most notably seen in Mulan where Ming-Na Wen actually introduces Yi Fei Liu, one Mulan to the next, and the same thing happening with Ariel with Jodie Benson giving her a dingle hopper to Halle Bailey. And they point this out because it constantly reminds you of what they're adapting by having them symbolically gift their role to the next one in the animated and to the real life live action, one giving them their torch that had the better film in the first place compared to this pile of trash. And it's one that's going to constantly continue in other remakes like Lilo and Stitch when the voice actors of David and Nani are actually going to be in that film in the roles of their own superiors or bosses. Where funny enough, David's voice actor, Jason Scott Lee, actually starred as the main villain of Mulan's very own remake, and also starred in the very first live action Disney remake in the Jungle Book in the 90s, and recently the Disney Plus reimagining of Doogie Howser and Doogie Kamealoha, which actually filmed in his backyard in Hawaii, showing more of what we expect in this future campaign cameo in one of my most favorite Disney films that they're going to butcher badly. The reason I bring this up is to try to keep positive before the Little Mermaid takes a turn for the worse, which it very will. And back to my point about the Caribbean is where I would like to mention about the town scene is how stupid the directors are when it comes to picking the film's setting. I mean, while having the Caribbean is not a completely bad idea and it's very great to what they wanted to show, it really doesn't make sense in the context of the original story and the time frame it's supposed to take place. Because if you notice very carefully and hear it, you notice that they're using steel pens, the iconic instrument down in the Caribbean. The reason I bring this up is because of that time frame I just mentioned. If you notice the ships they use and the kingdom they are in roughly from both in the original and the remake, then you can somehow infer it takes place in the early 19th century, about the time the original novel was actually published in 1837. And the steel pen itself actually wasn't invented until the 1930s in Trinidad in Tobago, meaning that this shouldn't actually be here at all. It makes sense under the sea to actually have the sounds of the steel pen in a fictional creatures like they did in the original, but for a time period like this in the human world long before they even actually existed does not make any sense. Where at this very time they didn't have the materials to do so and were doing tambu bamboo in this time period, and not steel pans at all. I know this feels nitpicky like my earlier points, but when you want your film to be real for the most part, then you really shouldn't actually be doing these things that don't happen quite yet. A problem with setting it in a place and having other scenes that show a time that really doesn't make sense at all, like Eric's ship and whatnot that clearly shows that this takes place over hundreds of years ago at this point. It really doesn't match up for me compared to the original. I mean the scene almost had me, but I still remember what exactly this video is for and I still need to criticize it overall even if my points are pretty petty and minor. I'm sorry if that actually seems that way and it seems nitpicky like this or Arrow Sister, but then again this is Disney we are talking about, a company that doesn't really care about world building or story details anymore, banging off of the ideas that have already been done to great success and trying to do it again just because they can. So if you know that fact, then you realize that setting this in the Caribbean overall with this Jamaican attitude because of how Sebastian talks and whatnot doesn't make sense because the musical and instruments in that very film were not invented yet, being almost a hundred years too early before the time actually happens. But anyways, this leads us to the Kiss the Girl sequence, where they get on a boat and how Sebastian tries to make it his very mission to help kiss the girl. I mean not himself because that's gross, but helping Eric kiss Ariel, who still has to forget that she has to kiss him, 
just because. And this is actually going to be more painful for all of you considering that this is the prime song that you wanted to change the lyrics to be sensitive for. And this comes from Alan Making again stating that some of the lyrics were updated in response to viewers who had gotten sensitive about the idea that Prince Eric would in any way force himself onto Ariel. But then again this line actually doesn't make any sense if you actually watch the original movie. The one you yourself actually worked on Alan with Howard Ashman who actually wrote these lyrics and made it for a purpose to stop Ursula from winning. And how it just seems like you just forgot that this is actually what happened. But the changes are so small and minimal where it really doesn't feel like they really didn't even need to do it at all in the first place, notably seen in this part. It don't take a word, not a single word, go on and kiss the girl. These lyrics show Sebastian encouraging Eric to go on and kiss the girl, that she wants him to do it by her facial expressions and advances towards him. And of course it actually makes sense where they are coming from to remove these lyrics on face view, but the idea that Prince Eric would force himself onto Ariel is also non-existent in the entire scene and the entire movie because Ariel is the one who wants to kiss him and Eric is actually portrayed as the shy one who doesn't know and doesn't want to force himself into love at this point, mainly of course for the girl of the sea with her voice and of course just spending time with somebody he actually met recently. Recently. There is no indication here that he would force himself onto Ariel in any way because that's not what his character is like at all. But they still went ahead with this and changed it, elongating the lyrics to say this. This change just wants him to ask before he does because one, she forgets that she's supposed to kiss him, and two, they just did this to be sensitive to modern times, trying to actually have consent to kiss the girl before actually doing that. That they are doing the opposite of what the original did because she actually forgets even though she almost doesn't, shying away when Eric was actually trying to kiss the girl. That somehow makes it seem like the new lyrics are actually very pointless because he's technically forcing himself onto her when she doesn't actually want it because he's led on by the song to actually kiss her while she pulls away because she doesn't want to or and of course actually forgets to. These changes that they're making are just so overall pointless and minor to the visible eye, how they really just don't matter overall in trying to say something about modern society rather than the story and lyrics that were actually created. Once again reminding you that Howard Ashman created these lyrics for a purpose Disney, that they were there for a reason and why they actually flowed well in the first place. I mean for an organization that tries to push pride itself on representation of everybody, you do a bang up job at removing lyrics that were actually made by a gay man himself. I mean I also can't say that they pride themselves on pride when they constantly make each new movie introduce their first new gay character ever. Like look here and look there, this is our new first gay character, did you know Disney did their first gay character? Like this is the first time in forever in the film because it actually has no plot relevance at all and easily removable so that we can release movies in China and Russia. But the point here is the fact that this song is designed for Sebastian to somehow convince Eric that this girl wants this and she is the answer to save him. That when it happens she will have her voice back and remain human and be the person that he actually discovered. That this is what she overall wants. They wouldn't do this if she wasn't in love with him or even dared to force himself onto Ariel to a character that is incapable capable of being designed that way at all. Like my goodness, this movie just keeps surprising you to how low they're willing to actually take it. You could say one thing about this overall, but you just managed to do the opposite thing, placing things out of order here and there, and the lyrics that don't need or don't communicate the points properly because of how they just don't understand what is being shown. The next scene that happens is also one that took place before they actually went to town in the original, where Triton actually needs to find Ariel, showcasing how they use the sisters in the new one and remove the fact that they actually had other sea creatures in the film because somehow this 250 million dollar film couldn't actually do that at all. But this moment is meant to showcase more regret on King Triton's side. One after the last time we saw him was actually destroying Ariel's own collection. How you can actually see he's desperate and worried, demanding that they actually search everywhere for Ariel. That it reminds you above all that actually happened, that he actually antagonized her daughter in the scene, that he actually still loves her dearly and always looked out for her best interest to keep her safe. But also knowing what he actually did was actually wrong as he says here. This shows a level of vulnerability to his character and the realization of what he actually done that put Ariel apart to what we have already seen. That he refused to listen to her side and now she's nowhere to actually be found. Like a loving father actually would display after realizing his own faults. And you can actually hear it in his own voice. But in the remake however with Javier once again, it shows completely nothing. No emotion and no action. 
I mean, you know he's desperate to find her, I mean, you can subtly see it in the way he displays it very well, but it still lacks the emotion that the original had, where you can see those points being expressed very well in the animation and the voice acting. How it's portrayed that he knows that he did was wrong, where this one is mostly blank, especially to how he delivers that same line as before. There is just no emotion whatsoever or care that the original showed in this very line anymore, and it seems like Rob Marshall just really didn't care enough to actually get the best out of his actors, to portray the vulnerability and sadness that they already had, where you can clearly see he's remorseful about what he's done, but like everything else in this film, it's just very bland. Every single adaptation they keep doing manages to subtract every single point including the acting emotions that were originally displayed, where that is actually supposed to be the single most important part to how a story can work. If you can't deliver such power that matches the animated form, then your movie really doesn't justify being a legit adaptation of such work at all. The plays and performances of these movies with real life actors actually have more emotion displayed than anything this film actually had. Just like why do they insist on the takes they use in the final film when they clearly could have actually done a couple more that actually conveyed what's being done much better. It just doesn't make sense other than the fact that probably Rob Marshall is the most passive director who doesn't actually want to try to actually make a real story, directed only by Disney's greed overall instead of providing something actually great. But after this short scene, it leads us back to the castle where they finish their adventure around town and how Ursula actually plans to stop them. Where cheat almost didn't work considering what the story is adapting, now trying to actually stop it by disguising herself as Vanessa. It's not shown initially in the live action version like the original did, but done when Eric is actually out by sea. How Ariel's voice is actually calling once again being used by Ursula at the moment where she just appears like that, compared to how she just walked towards land with Ariel's voice actually being used. They don't really actually use her voice much in the remake because that's not really the voice of actually who's playing Vanessa, English actress Jessica Alexander. And for what it's actually worth, I think she actually performed the role very well, really capturing the evil Ursula displayed in human form as the antithesis of Ariel. And I really can only hope that at the very least she would actually be in a much better film because her acting really goes above and beyond most part about what we've already seen at this point even though it's very minimal. But back in the movie, the worst part about this is how it really shows nothing that Eric is actually being controlled by Vanessa's voice. The original one actually makes it clear that he's actually being hypnotized, where instead in the remake it's actually up for interpretation at the very least. Not not knowing if it's actually happening at all because it's not really shown. Because the original actually showed us that Ursula was desperate to win at all costs, that even up to the point where it removed Eric's own free will. And it's something I will talk a little bit later when they actually show up together because of how blatantly awful it is. But it's not as awful as what actually comes next, which is definitely the worst Disney song I've ever heard at this very point. And yes, I am talking about the infamous Scuttlebutt, Aquafina's awkward rap that was made by Lin-Manuel Miranda himself. And I would like to take this moment here in the part of the film to appreciate what Lin has actually done in the past. He's not a bad writer or singer at all, as seen with Hamilton and especially the fantastic movie he's done in other Disney films like in Moana and Encanto. These two movies carry my most favorite Disney songs to date and it's all thanks to him where both stand out also as Disney's greatest movies, where without it they wouldn't have actually had the impact they have when they actually made at this point, that his songs actually elevated that to why people actually enjoy those movies. But sadly for what he was doing with The Little Mermaid made and when he signed on, he dropped the ball real hard, and I really blame Disney mostly for this, for stretching him to work on this bland film instead of the creative work that made sense for his previous two Disney projects. Because instead of the fun songs like Les Poissons that I loved in the original when I was a child, they instead decided to remove it and replace it with a crap rap that sounds exactly like this. Hey, have you not heard that scat No, the gossip, the buzz! What the fuck were they even thinking? Why does this even exist? Like literally why? Why does does this actually have to be in the movie when it's just so out of tune with the new songs and the original songs overall? How does this song actually make logical sense for them to do compared to a scene in the original where Scuttle just talks to Ariel being excited about the supposed marriage that Eric has? How instead, this addition is just complete nonsense and makes everything about her character much more worse than what has been already shown. Just like, thank you Disney, thank you for providing these lyrics that make my life a living hell. Like seriously, nobody on this planet actually even enjoys this when it it can actually sound just like this. Remember the swamp? Remember my song in the swamp? And I was like, wah, chicka, wah, wah, chicka, wah. I 
While this is truly the most agonizing thing that has been ever created and Aquafina does a great job at hurting my ears in that very process. Because in that one line and one scene alone, it somehow makes her performance as Sisu in Ryan the Last Dragon look like the greatest acting performance ever and that is one of the most annoying portrayals Disney has ever created up until this point. Like up until this point in this film, it wasn't as bad as you would think where she was even tolerable in songs like Kiss the Girl compared to the original Scuttle that actually squawked and being annoying at some moments, but extending this into Scuttlebutt itself with this awful rap that both Sebastian and Scuttle performs just makes it so unbearable. You cannot justify this existing because of how it really doesn't fit in the entire movie at all. How it also really just doesn't even fit with every new addition and song that they also created for this very film. There is just no reason to have this rap when it doesn't fit the characters of the world at all. This would fit better in an original adaptation like Encanto did because the movie was already designed with how certain songs are actually performed at first because it's original. We're having this moment actually adds nothing because it adapts a film that was already designed to be one way. Like why are you insisting that this must be done when it hardly actually matters in the moment of the film and everything else? The original is just short and straight to the point without any fuss and now you're extending a moment to something it's not. Why do you keep making the worst decisions for the film? It doesn't benefit anyone in any way. Just stop ruining everything you make you idiots. Stop doing things that people are incapable of doing and just make a film that actually stands for something. But anyways, I should actually stop it right there because it's not a good thing to focus on something that has no impact and makes me overall angry to the stories at all. Or we have to get back to the moment of the film where she discovers that Eric is also with another girl. The moment that makes her sad to see him with someone else and breaks her heart because that's what she actually wanted. At least that's what we hoped for considering the contract was fucked up in this version of the movie to actually forget to kiss Eric. One where she actually leaves in sadness at the moment but also one where Scuttle discovers that Vanessa is also Ursula. A minor problem I actually have with this actual moment is how obviously it is Hallie's voice in on another woman who's in fact acting as another woman too so where it just comes off so weird and unnatural rather than the actual moment. A point where the animation just makes more sense because you can actually believe it more easier. Oh it's just better that way because we can do things more clearly that would actually seem off in certain moments. Like if you notice Vanessa's actor and her accent actually being in play and the voice that is clearly Hallie's in the moment and it just doesn't actually match up because it's two different voices and it's clearly visible to the naked eye. And also how they just disclude Vanessa's original song in that moment to really showcase her evil intentions. Just using her voice to go la 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 and that's it and then using her real voice as Ursula to reveal this. It just lacks the intention that was better provided in the original to utilize her actors in a more bigger way. But I understand why people like it because they utilize Hallie's voice in a haunting way for Ursula, but still doesn't make any sense to really shorten the moment when you expand others in the entire film. The moment where Arrow actually finds this out as well by Scuttle and everyone actually has to race to actually stop the engagement, not wedding like the original because that was honestly too fast to actually go through. And a major difference here is how this takes place at the castle rather than out sea like a party on the boat that they were on. How they actually stay here because somehow they just couldn't go grand enough with the $250 million budget for a remake. I understand why considering the different circumstances but it just shows another point that the animation had something more to offer than the freaking remake that is supposed to update those points and be more grand and real. But the overall terrible point about this sequence is actually Eric himself. How during his engagement we clearly see him not under a spell at all by Ursula's charms still wondering where Ariel is at this moment. Worried about her and not knowing what exactly he wants. How Grinsby actually notices this change compared to what he did with Ariel. This is not like you. I'm sure I understand it myself. This is something that makes no sense whatsoever to how he actually feels in this situation where like I mentioned earlier he was hypnotized by Ursula in the original by Ariel's own voice to actually obey her own commands. She removed any sense of humanity he had and became her own personal puppet that we see throughout. Where by no means is this shown at all in this film where he retains his senses and still chooses this random woman to be engaged this early despite not knowing much about her compared to what he did with Ariel. This act alone dumbs down his character much more than they realize with how he just dives into this act at all and how his mother actually accepts it despite treating this one girl he spent more time with and that he still cares for at his own party. Nothing about this scene actually makes any sense where it's just easier to believe that Ursula was actually controlling him this entire time. To see an indication that actually convinces something isn't right like Grinsby insisted, how there must be a reason to why it's actually happening rather than being overall vague. It's just not great to do this and show this because there is nothing to be shown. Ursula is shown to be a woman who gives what she wants through her deals and does whatever 
whatever it takes to get them. Not the lame ass cheat one they actually did, but that never actually mattered to the story, but the one where she actually manipulates Eric's free will to do that and kick Red's hopes and dreams out of there forever so that she could rule the seven seas. It just logically does not make sense for him to think that way. He spent like 12 hours with this one girl and you are leaving the girl you spent like two days with already. And once again, because they don't have the budget or creativity to do so, they mostly have Ariel take center stage to battle Vanessa in the moment, removing the fun the sequence had where a bunch of animals actually attack Ursula at the winning. I mean, they do have animals, but they're real and they can only do the minimum with them and instead have to do Ariel with her. Once again, trying to put her in the spotlight to be more empowering overall in the film. The moment where she actually gains her voice back and how Eric actually retains his consciousness to realize it was her all along. A moment that was actually not earned in this version of the movie because he went with this girl without being hypnotized again, making him appear to be overall stupid not knowing what the hell he's even doing with his life. It just feels more earned in the original because Eric actually broke free from Ursula's spill and was happy to actually know it was Ariel all along, who he actually connected with from the time they spent like together. But in here it's like, oh no, I'm sorry, I don't know what came over me, where neither did the audience as well to be frank, not knowing why you would actually go for this woman on day one, considering the fact you're only on day two with this other girl, man. I'm just wondering at this point, who exactly approves these movies? Who up there at Disney is saying that, yes, this is the movie that we want. This totally gets what the original had and is more for the times, because honestly, it just doesn't work. But once again, we go back to the same sequence where it is too late for Eric and Ariel to get together, where she transforms back into to a mermaid and they go back into the sea where she is hers forever at least that's what the rules actually imply, the moment where King Triton finds them and tries to stop her. The original is powerful and demanding where the new one, well, is like this. Ursula. <laughs> okay then, Ursula. I just actually love the newer one in this moment because of how Javier Bardem actually pronounces Ursula. This isn't a real criticism of about the scene, but just how his accent makes it feel very different at moments, but how they just don't utilize it to its fullest potential. But to be serious about this, is how King Triton cannot stop Ursula because they signed a contract and the only way he can save her is taking her place and losing his powers to actually set her free. But the key difference here is the transformation himself after he signs his powers over to here. The original one shows he turns into a poor unfortunate soul like the rest we saw earlier after the deals they actually make with Ursula are up. Their price to attain something means to actually serve her as a measly afterthought. But in the remake, he's apparently sort of kind of maybe should be killed off by Flotsam and Jetsam? Like he just sinks into the abyss and that's it. He's literally gone from the scene and from the movie from this point on. Like why are they deciding to do this other than the obligatory cannot transform into CGI poor unfortunate souls? Like what exactly is this doing that helps them change at the end of the film to actually set her free? Because the reason he was transformed to be like this is that so he could actually witness what would actually happen in the final battle between Ursula, Eric, and Ariel. The reason he actually gives Ariel what she wants in the end and now it's not given to us at all. There's just nothing for him to grow in his character because he can't now because he's dead, where they just forgot that this is supposed to be the most important thing to the original movie. Ariel and Eric really didn't need to change at all because they were dead set in their ways from beginning to end, where it was her father that actually needed to change with what is being learned. The development that this movie has is mainly supposed to be on Triton and now he's removed from that and now seemingly dead at this point where he's not supposed to be at all, just removed where he cannot witness what he's supposed to have. It just doesn't make sense for them to do this when that wasn't the intention of it at all in the first place but somehow it just keeps getting worse on from here, pushing the boundaries of how far they can actually ruin our beloved films that made our own childhood. In this scene, Eric finally joins in to rescue Ariel similar to the original and how Flotsam and Jetsam actually chase to stop him. It's built up the same where they actually grab him and how Ariel actually stops her from killing Eric by redirecting it to her babies. And I want you to keep these scenes in mind to how similar it is because of how it actually impacts Ariel and Ursula's characters to how they are going to butcher the sequence when she does blow up to be Giganta Ursula. How it's very clear that she's sad at this loss and angry at Ariel for actually killing them. How she actually forced her to shoot at the wrong target that was her own babies. Where the awfulness of this scene begins by how dark it is overall where you really can't see Gigantocarthy's face at all, hiding the terrible CGI that they really didn't clearly spend any time on. Like literally compared to the original animation where you can clearly see it's Ursula right in front of them, the remake instead mostly hides her face because it's a CGI rendering of Melissa McCarthy's Ursula. 
I hate this because you really cannot see her and the expression she hissed to being this most powerful sea witch of the seas, showing how telling it is that the CGI rendering they did wasn't finished and I really hate it, it just seems more fake. I just don't like this because of how things look so fucking awful instead, which they have actually done this for the past few years in their Marvel films and whatnot, and how we are actually living in this new age where films like Avatar that feature water characters are being released that go above and beyond being more realistic and more alive, where everything else after it instead, like The Little Mermaid, look completely like shit instead, and that is something that is inexcusable for the budget they have, clearly just not caring about the quality of the film, but rather the pathetic quantity of stories that they have that they can produce, that they don't want to create anymore. But the main point of the scene here is how Ursula is focusing on Ariel, after everything she's done that ruined her plans and actually killed her own babies, that she wants to punish her because she messed up everything for her and not Eric, and how that is turned into the opposite in this version of the film, where Eric is out there trying to survive, or Ursula somehow just wants to focus on him, even when he didn't kill her eels at all. And this is the most pathetic scene in the entire movie because it confirmed what we were already worried about before, where Disney remakes time and time again put women on higher pedestals and reduce the men in the film saving the day like the original films had. This was shown in the official Little Mermaid novelization before the film release, showcasing that Ariel was the one to steer the ship into Ursula. And that, my friend, is exactly what happened in the film and the thing I pointed out the most in my other videos that I clearly hated, that they refused to understand the situation and the roles that the characters had. Because if you realize what happened in the original, then you wouldn't be doing this at all. There is no reason Ariel should be doing this because Ursula was actually focused on getting her in the first place, how she killed her eels and actually wanted to take revenge on her for doing so and how Eric actually stepped in to actually save her in that process where doing this actually makes no sense because she has no legs and has no concept of how ships actually work. The point of Eric actually steering the ship is for Triton, who is actually alive in this moment to see that not all humans are actually bad, that they do care and actually show compassion and how he actually worked to actually save his own buried daughter. But that's not shown because now he's somehow dead and cannot actually experience that and has her saving the day instead because of Disney's need to actually have shallow female empowerment. That there was actually in the original an equal amount already back and forth to the characters to how they saved each other no matter what actually happened and now you just remove that so you can hype Ariel up a lot more. It's just so goddamn awful and you should be ashamed for making this movie at all. This movie has no real reason to exist at all because of this point that misunderstands the entire point of the fucking first movie. How are you this blind to what they set up in the original film? How are you just this tone deaf that you can't understand what movie you guys are producing in the first place in this day and age? You are ruining everything that made it special in the first place, you heartless soulless mistake of a company. Stop doing this. Gosh, I'm so sorry I'm getting upset at a princess film. But anyways, it still ends the same way where she gets killed and impaled by the ship and they get out safe from the actual situation. One where she saves Eric and tries to retrieve the trident to rescue her father finally, compared to the original that didn't actually need to happen because her death actually freed every merfolk, including her father, to be restored to their original bodies, being happy again now that this happened and ending the curse that she put upon her people. But of course here in the remake, instead, it's just that he gets to be alive again, because as we know earlier, he actually died, as we saw, but actually didn't because that's how the trident works somehow. But this scene also doesn't work too, because she has to explain that both her and Eric actually saved her, when he actually didn't see it at all, and how, like I said in my explosive semi-rant, that the point of this entire scene was that so he could actually see it himself to actually encourage him to actually change in the end of the film. He cannot do it now because in this very moment, he was actually dead and now suddenly alive where he just says to her that we should go home now, that he's safe and that's all that matters, that he wasn't able to grow or change at this point like he did before because he wasn't able to do that at all by the direction the film gave him. They didn't give any reason that shows what was important to Ariel's own character, to finally understand what she's going through, only to create some emotional moment for Eric trying to reach out for her again at the end and Mother who understands that now but can't because two different worlds bro. It just really doesn't help the movie to be this way because he was shown that his viewpoint was wrong, how you really didn't see him in this sequence but you actually knew he was alive to witness that, enough where the next scene did cut to him understand this right after. The entire point of this movie was to show who has to change when it comes to how others act including your own offspring and that they will eventually grow up from and want to do their own things in life. Ariel already knew what she actually wanted that was different but it was actually Triton that needed to change in the entire story. He needed to change because that's what allowed characters like Ariel to actually grow and flourish in their own life. But just elongate it now to showcase the scenes and just do it because they thought long and hard about it. But it's just not earned for him to actually have these moments and actually 
actual thoughts because they actually didn't see the scene himself that he actually needed to change by what actions were being performed on the surface rather than his close-minded way of thinking. The one thing I will appreciate about this though is how King Triton is letting her go like he did in the original. That now we get to see the scene that he actually feels emotional almost crying that he's finally ready to let her daughter go. Accepting that this is what she wants and who she was to him as his youngest daughter. How this shows that they clearly can have emotion in the film with their actors but they just refuse to actually try to do that for the rest of the film with the text they actually given. How it wasn't there in their overall bland tone and now only just seen in the last few seconds. It's how these minor details can make or break a film and how they just constantly decide to break it instead by extending far more than it actually needed to be and actually focusing on actually improving the aspects to actually make the story work for the characters to be connectable to the very audience. Because the original is short and sweet and shows how Ariel is thankful to her father finally embracing Eric before they get married, where now instead it's just long and painful and more ambiguous to what is actually happening. Yes, they do meet again in a slower, more emotional moment where they finally kiss for the first time, but then again its ending instead just ruins by how they just get on a boat and leave. No wedding or grand boat celebration and a happy ending, but just getting on a boat and leaving. Because this version really didn't want to focus on the marriage aspect and instead of being the free bird one, where they go instead to chart their own destiny wherever they were going. Where once again in this end sequence with the celebration, they have this blatant time period inaccuracies with the freaking steel pans in the 1800s, where, and just be more open with where they wanted to go with them. It's not bad necessarily to have this ending, but I think the original has a lot more charm to how everything was actually earned, that it actually had the tools to actually build it up rather than how this actually knocked it all down to get to this point. It never really earned it in the same way this one did, despite having a decent send off with how Ariel and Triton actually interact. Because I think this moment instead was actually pretty great to showcase how Triton was actually there for her and understands her now and grows, but it just wasn't earned in the same way like the original. All of the scenes we actually seen up to this point did not actually make up to how it was earned in this end. How I think the original film instead with them hugging at the end could have actually benefited from having this conversation as well to extend that but how did they just decide not to play that route at all? And then compared to the happy ending where people are celebrating and cheering with the merfolk finally out in the open with the humans, it's just instead like they're just there. The merfolk are just staring at Ariel, not really spying or anything for the most part, being content like the humans are, where it's just blank expressions. I mean, a few do actually smile and mostly the kids for the most part, but overall it just feels weird how they're just standing there compared to how they just appear up and actually celebrating and waving goodbye, where instead the movie just sends them off just like that to ride on the boat. And honestly, because of that, it's just very stupid compared to how most films actually end on happier notes with everyone actually celebrating, where this one actually should have had one too just like the original, but just didn't where they just went like nope just zooming off like that and then the movie just over and out. Not really grand in any way, just like most Disney films should be, finally ending another Disney nightmare that we really couldn't actually care about. So as we can see overall, The Little Mermaid remains to be a pathetic remake that never actually understood what movie it was adapting. Is it the worst remake Disney has ever made? No, it's actually not even close, where even the recent ones like Pinocchio are objectively worse and Mulan and the photorealistic Lion King are truly at the bottom that I hold more hatred for. Because this is a film that actually did have a little bit more merit to it being made with an actual story that actually was good, that actually could have been decent, but actually not considering what happened in this film that proved how much animation is just more effective as a storytelling medium for stories such as this. And this isn't to say that they actually couldn't because they still clearly did and many people actually liked it more so than other films, but it just pales into comparison to what it was adapting. It's a film that represents the true purpose of what these films are, products that are being made to be pushed out rather than stories that are being shared to be enjoyed. Because if they did make this movie to just do that, then they actually failed in the most pathetic way possible. Because this is not a film that stands out on its own based already on something that we've already seen to this day. Also showed instead a time that Disney actually cared for it and how many people were actually required to actually bring it to life. That they themselves actually understood that the story can only be told in this very way that served its characters and music to justice as described by Howard Ashman. That it really needs to encourage Disney to utilize animation instead to its fullest potential instead of dragging it down for easier big bucks that these films make and will continue to do so until they run out of films. How instead of doing this, maybe go back and revisit stories that actually went under the radar like Atlantis and Black Cauldron that could work in a live action setting that is better for adapting rather than what they do for the worse as well. But until that day comes, we will unfortunately have to live with these terrible decisions, including one later with Snow White being the next major remake where it really feels like no one actually involved with that film actually understands even a hint about what they are adapting or respecting what is actually being made that made Disney into what it is today. The disrespect that some are showing that actually makes it for the worse. Where without that respect, the nothing we see here today shouldn't actually exist at all, and will not if they don't focus on creating newer stories in the future. 
but unless we see something that you're willing to change, feel free to keep digging yourself into the abyss where nobody will eventually miss you. And with that said, please just watch the original film, and not this one at all. And I'm all done, so goodbye.